What's up geeks and game masters? Welcome to the Hobby Hub. Your resident GM Gabe here and today we're going to do our very first D&D 5e character build and it's going to be everyone's favorite red-haired fox demon from the hit anime Yu Yu Hakusho. This will be a step-by-step -step guide showing you exactly what to pick at each level. Now let's bust out our rose whip and get into character. So, to start things off, we're going to provide Kurama with his starting stats. I went with the standard point method for this video, which will give us ability scores of 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8, which we can place anywhere. You can feel free to roll if you'd like, or use the point by method, whichever works for you, but the numbers you get should look something like this. Wisdom will be our highest ability score, as Kurama has been around for a very long time, so he's very experienced. Next should be Intelligence, which is undoubtedly one of Kurama's greatest strengths aside from his knowledge through experience. The next highest will be Dexterity, as Kurama is known for his ability to maneuver his body with great skill and agility. The fourth highest should be Constitution, because Kurama's will to continue fighting even when he's hurt has been tested numerous times, and he always manages to pull through. The fifth highest stat will be Charisma, due to Kurama always having his head in a book or some other form of study, he doesn't really socialize. And finally, our lowest stat will be Strength, because Kurama never takes on an enemy with brute force. He always approaches every situation with tact to outsmart the opponent. <laughs> you never defeat me by just running away! <laughs> yes, Genbu, I believe you're right. We're going to select the human variant race to give us an extra learned language aside from common. I chose infernal because of Kurama's demonic heritage. We get a plus one to two different ability scores which we will place in wisdom and dexterity, making them a total of 16 for wisdom and 14 for dexterity. I know, although Kurama is technically a demon, he escaped demon world by transferring his soul to the womb of a human, making him a half human. We also gain a skill proficiency. I went with Insight because Kurama has the uncanny ability to read his opponents during a fight and make a plan to stay a few steps ahead of them. And finally, we get to choose a feat. I went with Warcaster, which grants us advantage on concentration saving throws against damage, we can cast the somatic components of a spell without a free hand, and we can cast a spell with a casting time of one action as an opportunity attack. You'll find out why I picked this feat shortly. Our background will be the criminal, because if you've watched Yu Yu Hakusho, you'll know that in Kurama's past life as a demon, he was known as the legendary bandit Yoko Kurama, who stole valuable items to attain power in Demon World. The criminal background will provide us with skill proficiencies in stealth and deception, tool proficiencies in gaming set and thieves tools, as well as equipment consisting of a crowbar, a set of dark common clothes including a hood, and a pouch of 15 gold pieces. We really don't need the crowbar, but what the hell. We've been waiting 10 hours for a crowbar that says Supreme. Oh, I didn't even know it said Supreme. I just want a fucking crowbar. Our starting class will be Druid, as Kurama is very attuned with the forces of nature. This will provide us with the hit die of a d8 and a starting hit point total of 9 hit points because of our plus 1 con modifier. We also gain armor proficiencies with light and medium armor, as well as shields that aren't made of metal. Weapon proficiencies with clubs, daggers, darts, javelins, maces, quarterstaffs, scimitars, sickles, slings, and spears, which we aren't even going to use at all. I'll explain shortly. As a druid, we also gain saving throw proficiencies with intelligence and wisdom, and we can choose two skill proficiencies from the following. Arcana, Animal Handling, Insight, Medicine, Nature, Perception, and Survival. I chose Nature and Perception because Kurama is very knowledgeable of the forces of nature and he is very adept at perceiving his surroundings. Our starting class equipment gives us the option of selecting a wooden shield or any simple melee weapon, a scimitar or any simple melee weapon. For both of these I just picked up two daggers. We get a set of leather armor, an explorer's pack, and a druidic focus, which will be his signature rose whip. As a first level druid, we understand druidic, which is the secret language of the druids, which can be flavored as the language he uses to cast his spells, making the languages we know at first level common, infernal, and druidic. We also gain the ability to cast spells shown here on the druid class table. 
we gain two cantrips of our choice, two first level spell slots, and we can prepare up to four spells a day from the druid spell list because of our plus three in wisdom and our one level in the druid class. Our spell attack bonus is a plus five because of our proficiency bonus of plus two and our wisdom modifier of plus three. We also have a spell save DC of 13 because eight plus our proficiency bonus of two plus our wisdom modifier of three equals 13. The cantrips I chose were Druidcraft and Thorn Whip. If you haven't figured it out already, Thorn Whip will serve as our Rose Whip. The reason I chose Warcaster as a feat was because of the ability to cast a spell as an opportunity attack. Thorn Whip will be the only weapon we use for this character, aside from the spells we cast, so the daggers we chose won't really have an effect on this build. Keep that in mind. The four first level spells I prepared were Absorb Elements, Entangle, Fog Cloud, and Healing Word. This will provide us with plenty of battlefield control, which is what Kurama is great at. For Kurama's personality traits, I put, I will study my opponent and strike when I find a weakness, and I hide my true feelings and emotions to prevent the enemy from gaining an edge on me. To really play the role of Kurama, you must think tactfully and with patience, never revealing your hand until it's too late for the enemy to react. For Kurama's ideals, I put, I will do my best to put my past behind me. I will make a new person out of myself. I put this because although Kurama's original plan when escaping Demon World was to return years later as Yoko Kurama, he has realized that his ways were wrong due to the caring nature of those around him. He has learned to appreciate the path he has chosen and learned to care for his friends and family. For Kurama's bonds, I put, My friends and family are what keep me fighting. I would risk my life to save theirs. Although Kurama is very stoic on the outside, he has a very caring heart on the inside and will demonstrate that through his actions. For Kurama's flaws, I put, I would do almost anything my enemy asks of me if the lives of my friends or family is in jeopardy. For this, I couldn't really think of a flaw that Kurama has other than his caring heart. Villains throughout the show have used Kurama's family and friends against him to get what they want, especially when they threaten to kill them. At level 2, we're going to take another level in the druid class in order to choose a druid circle. At second level, we have two d8s in our pool of hit die, and we have a max hit point total of 15. We also gain the druid feature Wild Shape, which at second level allows us to transform into a beast with a challenge rating of 1 fourth or lower twice a day. We won't really be transforming into beasts in this build because of the druid circle we take. We're going to take the Circle of Spores as our subclass because Kurama has shown his ability to plant seeds in the enemy, causing debilitating effects. From the Circle of Spores subclass, we gain the Cantrip Chill Touch for free, which is another great damage spell. We also gain two Circle of Spores features that will really help flesh out Kurama, Halo of Spores and Symbiotic Entity. Halo of Spores reads, Starting at second level, you are surrounded by invisible necrotic spores that are harmless until you unleash them on a creature nearby. When a creature you can see moves into a space within 10 feet of you or starts its turn there, you can use your reaction to deal 1d4 necrotic damage to that creature unless it succeeds on a constitution saving throw against your spell save DC. The necrotic damage increases to 1d6 at 6th level, 1d8 at 10th level, and 1d10 at 14th level. This ability is almost similar to Kurama's Seed of the Death Plant attack, which he used frequently throughout the show. You can easily flavor it to be just that. Symbiotic Entity reads, Also, at second level, you gain the ability to channel magic into your spores. As an action, you can expend a use of your wild shape feature to awaken those spores, rather than transforming into beast form. And you gain four temporary hit points for each level you have in this class, which for us will be a total of eight at this level. When this feature is active, you gain the following benefits. When you deal your Halo of Spores damage, roll the damage die a second time and add it to the total. Your melee weapon attacks deal an extra 1d6 necrotic damage to a target they hit. These benefits last for 10 minutes until you lose all these temporary hit points or until you use your wild shape again. Now this is where things may get complicated when playing this character, as the only weapon we'll be using is the cantrip Thorn Whip. In my personal opinion, yes, Thorn Whip is considered a melee weapon, as it states in the spell's description that it is a melee spell attack. Other DMs may disagree. In that case, you would just have to switch the weapon of choice to a whip, and instead of taking the feat Warcaster, you would take the feat Weapon Master to gain proficiency with whips. 
then instead of intelligence being the second highest ability score, it would be dexterity. But in all honesty, it isn't by any means overpowered to be able to use Thorn Whip with this feature, or any other class features such as sneak attack, which will be one of the features we get in this build. But talk to your DM and see if this is okay with them. If so, then ride on. If not, then hey, that's cool too, just as long as everyone has fun. And finally, at second level, we gain one more first level spell slot, leaving us with a total of three spells we can cast a day, and another spell we can have prepared. Here, you can choose whichever first level spell suits you the most, as I will probably use that to prepare a second level spell when we gain a second level spell slot next level. So at level 3, we're going to take another level in the druid class, making our total hit dice increase from 2d8 to 3d8, and our max hit points will increase to 21. The temporary hit points we gain from using Symbiotic Entity increases from 8 to 12 now that we're a 3rd level druid. As a 3rd level druid, we gain another 1st level spell slot, making it a total of 4. We also gain 2 2nd level spell slots, allowing us to prepare and cast spells from that level. As a 3rd level druid, we are now able to prepare a total of 6 spells divided between 1st and 2nd levels. I went ahead and left Absorb Elements, Entangle, Fog Cloud, and Healing Word as our first level spells, leaving us with two second level spells that we can prepare. I chose Dark Vision and Spike Growth. I picked Dark Vision to make up for being a human, and Spike Growth to further control the battlefield and deal some damage along the way. We also gained two second level spells that are always prepared for us with our Circle of Spores subclass. These spells are Blindness, Deafness, and Gentle Repose. So after everything, this is what our spells look like. At level 4, we're going to take another level in the Druid class. This grants us another d8 to our pool of hit dice, making it a 4d8. We're going to end up with a hit point maximum of 27, and we also get to pick an ability score improvement or feat. I went with a plus 2 to wisdom, making it a score of 18 and a modifier of plus 4. This will reflect on each of our wisdom based skills and saving throws. As a 4th level Druid, our symbiotic entity feature grants us 16 temporary hit points when activated. As for our spells, we gain another second level spell slot, leaving us with four first level spell slots and three second level spell slots. We also get to prepare two more spells of our choice from either first or second level. We pretty much have the spells that help us the most, so feel free to pick whichever two spells you feel are best. We also gain another cantrip of our choice. I went with Guidance, as Kurama is always there to provide wisdom and encouragement when necessary. So after finishing up, this is what Kurama should look like. At level 5, we're going to take our first level in the Rogue class, which grants us another d8 for our hit dice, leaving it at a total of 5d8. We end up with a max hit point total of 33, our proficiency bonus increases to a plus 3, which reflects on our proficient saving throws and skills, as well as our spell save DC and spell attack bonus. Our new spell save DC is 15, and our spell attack bonus is plus 7. When we multi-class as a rogue, we gain a skill proficiency from the rogue skill list. I chose investigation to further improve Kurama's intelligence-based abilities. As a first level rogue, we gain expertise in two skills that we're proficient in. For this, we're going to select insight, as it will help us the most as we progress in levels, leaving it at a plus 10. And we're going to select perception to further enforce Kurama's ability to carefully observe his surroundings, leaving it at a plus 10 as well as a passive perception of 20. We gain a sneak attack die equal to a d6 as a first level rogue. Now, this is another thing that you might have to discuss with your DM. Similar to the previous example with our circle of spores feature, sneak attack states that this bonus can only be applied to weapon attacks with a finesse property or a ranged weapon. And since we're using the cantrip thorn whip for our attacks, it might get complicated. In my opinion, thorn whip is technically a whip, which whips have the finesse property and it is a melee spell attack. As I've stated before, if your DM does not agree with this, then you simply need to take the feat Weapon Master instead of Warcaster in order to be able to use whips, then have Kurama's second highest stat be Dexterity. Problem solved. As a first level rogue, we also learn Thieves Cant, which isn't really important for this build, but hey, it's an extra language. At character level 5, our Thorn Whip's damage die increases to 2d6, and when paired with our Symbiotic Entity feature and Sneak Attack, we can be dealing a total of 4d6 to our attack rolls when using Thorn Whip, which in all honesty is by no means overpowered. I mean, it's only an average of 12 points of damage. 
At level 6, we're going to take another level in Rogue, giving us another d8 to our hit die total, leaving it at 6 d8, and our total of 39 hit points. We also gain Cunning Action to be able to use Dash, Disengage, or Hide as a bonus action, which can help reinforce the fact that Kurama is a quick thinker on the battlefield, allowing him to perform such actions quickly and easily. At level 7, we're going to take our third level in Rogue, leaving us at a total of 78 with our hit die and a total of 45 hit points. We can pick a roguish archetype at third level. I went with the Inquisitive Rogue. We gain the class features Ear for Deceit, which allows us to never roll below an 8 when making an inside check to determine if someone is lying. We gain Eye for Detail, which allows us to roll a perception or investigation check as a bonus action when uncovering hidden objects or searching for clues. We also gain the most important feature, Insightful Fighting, which allows us to use a bonus action to make an Insight versus Deception check against an enemy to apply our sneak attack damage instantly if we don't have disadvantage on the roll. It lasts for one minute or until we use the feature on another target. I chose the Inquisitive Rogue because of the Insightful Fighting feature. If you've watched the show, you'll know that Kurama carefully studies his opponent to find a weakness, then uses that vulnerability to win the fight. And since we really focused on insight as a skill, we will almost always be able to apply sneak attack on our targets. Our sneak attack damage also increases to 2d6 at third level, which will really help us in combat. At level 8, we're going to take yet another level in Rogue so that we gain the ability score increase or feat of our choosing. I went ahead and increased Wisdom all the way to a 20, making our ability score modifier a plus 5, which will reflect on each of our Wisdom based skills and saving throws, as well as our spell save DC and spell attack bonus. Our spell save DC is now a 16, and our spell attack bonus is a plus 8. Our inside checks now have a plus 11, which will help us with insightful fighting. We gain another d8 in our pool of hit die, making it a total of 8 d8, and we get a max hit point total of 51. At level 9, we're going to take another level in Rogue, leaving our hit die total at 98 and our hit point maximum at 57. Our proficiency bonus increases to a plus 4, which will make our proficient saving throws and skills increase by plus 1, and our expertise skills increase by plus 2. Our insight and perception checks are now at a plus 13 from our expertise feature. Our spell save DC increases to a 17, and our spell attack bonus increases to a plus 9. We also gain the uncanny dodge feature, which allows us to use a reaction to have an attack's damage if we can see the attacker. This is great because Kurama is very dexterous and has proven his survivability in a fight. Our sneak attack die also increases to 3d6, allowing us to deal more damage. At level 10, we're going to take our final level in the Rogue class, which gives us a total of 10d8 to our hit die and a max hit point total of 63. As a 6th level Rogue, we get to select another two skills and make them expertise skills. I chose Investigation, making it a plus 10, and Deception, making it a plus 8. I chose Investigation to further improve Kurama's ability to deduce clues and investigate his surroundings. I chose Deception because Kurama is a master of the poker face, never revealing how he truly feels to an enemy. So from here on out, we're just going to take the Druid all the way to character level 20. At this level, our hit dice increases to 11d8 and our max hit points increases to 69. Nice. Since we're now a 5th level druid, our symbiotic entity feature provides us with a total of 20 temporary hit points when we activate it. At this level, we also gain 2 3rd level spell slots, which allow us to prepare some spells from that level. We can prepare a total of 10 spells between 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. We already have 6 prepared from 1st and 2nd, so I went with the 3rd level spells Plant Growth and Speak with Plants to further control the battlefield and be able to, well, speak with plants. As for the other two prepared spells, you can pick whatever you feel is best for you. Keep in mind that we also gain two third level spells that are always prepared for us from the Circle of Spores subclass. These spells are Animate Dead and Gaseous Form. Our Thorn Whip's damage die also increases to 3d6. After everything, this is what our spell should look like. At level 12, we take another level in Druid giving us a 12d8 to our hit die and a total of 75 hit points. Our temporary hit points from Symbiotic Entity are now increased to 24. As a 6th level Druid, we get Fungal Infestation which allows us to use a reaction to animate a beast or humanoid that died within 10 feet of us. It has one hit point and uses the zombie stat block. 
Now, we won't really be using this feature, but it's very nice to have in dire situations, and we can easily flavor it to be caused from a seed from the death plant. At this level, our halo of spores damage now increases to a d6 rather than a d4. We also gain another third level spell slot and another spell we can prepare a day. Same as before, you can pick whichever spell you find most useful. At level 13, we're going to take Druid again, which gives us 13 d8 in our pool of hit die. Our hit points also increase to 81. Our symbiotic entity feature now grants us a total of 28 temporary hit points. Our proficiency bonus is now increased to a plus 5, which will give us a plus 1 on each of our proficient saving throws and skills. We will gain a plus 2 to each of our expertise skills, thus making our investigation a plus 12, our insight a plus 15, our perception a plus 15, and our deception a plus 10. Our spell save DC increases to an 18, and our spell attack bonus increases to a plus 10. As a 7th level druid, we gain a 4th level spell slot, which allows us to prepare spells from that level. As a 7th level druid with a wisdom modifier of plus 5, we can prepare a total of 12 spells of our choice. From 4th level, I chose Grasping Vine to control the battlefield even more, and Guardian of Nature to replicate the transformation of Yoko Kurama. As for the other spells, I'm leaving that up to you, as before. Keep in mind that we also gain the spells Blight and Confusion from our Circle of Spores subclass. So, at level 14, we're going to take another level in Druid, which gives us a total of 14 d8s to our hit die pool, and our max hit points are now at 87. Our Symbiotic Entity feature now grants us 32 temporary hit points. We also gain an ability score increase, or a feat, of our choice. I went ahead and increased our intelligence to 16 to help with saving throws and its relevant skills. We also gain another 4th level spell slot, allowing us to cast more of those spells a day. We can also gain another spell to prepare, but like before, you can pick whatever benefits you the most. At level 15, we're going to take another level in Druid, which will increase our hit die to 15d8. We will have a max hit point total of 93. Our symbiotic entity feature now grants us 36 hit points. As a 9th level Druid, we gain another 4th level spell slot, leaving us at 3 in total. We also gain our first 5th level spell slot, which allows us to cast from that level. At this point, we can prepare a total of 14 spells between each spell level. For 5th level spells, I chose Geesh and Wrath of Nature to once again further control the battlefield and be able to control the mind of an individual. As for the other spells that you can prepare, it's up to you. We also gain two more spells that are always prepared for us with the Circle of Spores subclass. These spells are Cloud Kill and Contagion. At level 16, we're going to take another level in Druid, making our hit die a total of 16d8 and our max hit points at a 99. Our temp hit points from Symbiotic Entity increases to 40. We gain the Spreading Spores feature, which allows us to use a bonus action to hurl spores 30 feet away from us while our Symbiotic Entity feature is active, allowing us to apply our Halo of Spores damage. This helps provide more range when planting our Seed of the Death plant on our enemies. On top of that, our Halo of Spores damage increases to a D8. We also gain another 5th level spell slot, making it a total of 2, allowing us to cast more of those spells a day. We also gain another cantrip of our choice. For this, you can pick whatever suits you the most. At level 17, we're going to take another level in the Druid class, which gives us another D8 in our pool of hit die, making it a total of 17 D8. Our hit point maximum also increases to 105. Our temp hit points we get from Symbiotic Entity increases to 44. Our proficiency bonus increases to a plus 6, which will in turn provide a plus 1 to all skills and saving throws that we are proficient in, and a plus 2 to each skill we have expertise in, making our investigation a plus 15, our insight a plus 17, our perception a plus 17, and our deception a plus 12. Our spell save DC is now at a 19, and our spell attack bonus is now a plus 11. As a level 11 druid, we gain our first 6 level spell slot and a total of 16 spells that we can prepare a day. For the 6 level spells, I chose Druid Grove and Wall of Thorns. As for the other spells, feel free to choose whatever you wish. Our Thorn Whip's damage die also increases to 46 at this level. At level 18, we're going to take another level in the Druid class, granting us a total of 18 d8 and a max hit point total of 111. Our temp hit points from Symbiotic Entity increases to 48. 
we also get to pick an ability score improvement or a feat of our choosing. I went ahead and increased our intelligence to an 18 to improve Kurama's intellect, which will in turn provide us with a plus one to all saving throws and skills that are derived from the intelligence stat. At level 19, we're going to take another level in Druid, which will give us a total of 19d8 for our hit die and a maximum hit point total of 117. Our temp hit points from Symbiotic Entity improves to 52. At this level, we finally gain a 7th level spell slot, which allows us to cast from that level. We have a total of 18 spells that we can prepare. For the 7th level spells, I chose Mirage Arcane and Regenerate. As for those other spells, you can choose whichever you find best. And finally, at level 20, we're going to take our last level in the Druid class, which will give us a total of 20d8 in our pool of hit die and a max hit point total of 123. Our temp hit points from Symbiotic Entity increases to 56. We gain our last Circle of Spores feature, which will help us improve Kurama's great survivability. This feature is Fungal Body, and it reads, at 14th level, the fungal spores in your body alter you. You can't be blinded, deafened, frightened, or poisoned, and any critical hit against you counts as a normal hit instead, unless you're incapacitated. And as for our spells at 20th level, we have a grand total of 4 known cantrips and 19 spells that we can prepare from the druid class, not including the free ones we gain from our subclass, and we have a max casting level of 7, which isn't bad at all. At 20th level, if we use our Symbiotic Entity feature and our Insightful Fighting to apply Sneak Attack, we could be dealing a grand total of 8d6 damage with our Rose Whip, which is an average of 24 points of damage. Or, if you're using a regular Whip, 1d4 plus 4d6 plus your Dex modifier damage, which would land you around 19 points of damage. This is why I say it really isn't overpowered to be using the Cantrip Thorn Whip instead of a regular Whip. The damage difference at 20th level is only a 5 point spread, which to be honest is pretty subpar compared to others who may be in your party. But like I said before, if your GM allows this, then awesome. If they don't, well, it really isn't much of an issue, as long as everyone is having fun at the table. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, let us know in the comment section along with any questions, comments, or concerns. You can also reach us at our Instagram. Also, let us know if you want to see more builds like this and of what characters we would love to hear from you. Salutations, brave adventurers. Until next, we meet again. Bang.